Hello, everybody. My name is Pete Brown. I'm a network engineer with AutoZone. And today we're going to talk about making a mesh of the infrastructure, the Dirtful approach. So a little bit about myself. I've been bouncing around the IT world of Memphis for the last 20 years. I've worked on a number of different uh, functional areas over time. And I've, I have now have a great amount of respect for, uh, for things like data quality when it comes to our infrastructure sources. So the talk today will revolve around uh, ideas of improving our abilities to share information across functional areas. Now, to prepare for today's uh, today's talk, I use a a couple of very valuable tools from the uh, from the DevNet uh, tool arsenal. So, my favorite items include the the uh, building an IOX application with Docker tutorial and the associated sandbox. When we get to the demo later, pretty much every bit of code has been tested and containerized and is meant to run uh, on network devices because you know, the network is at the heart of what we do and it's the most stable parts of our environment. So the, uh, the idea is that the mesh, pro the mesh components we'll be looking at should be running on, switch on core switches. So the challenge that we're gonna look at, we're often asked to collect and analyze data from disparate infrastructure source types. Anybody who's worked across different functional areas knows that at one time or another, you're going to be asked to analyze data sets, maybe call manager users against an Active Directory data set. And the challenge we run into is the components are changing all the time. The instances, the versions, uh, there's just a, a great deal of change. And so if you do a true up one day and then you know, six months later, you have to do the same thing, there's often a bit of a retooling rework you have to do to accommodate for the changes in the environment. So the challenge that we're trying to tackle is how do we reduce the amount of work that needs to be done you know, when you need to true up time and time again uh, anytime you want to analyze disparate data sets. So for the purpose of this talk, the, uh, the term infrastructure system, any system normally managed by IT groups. A source is any system from which data needs to be retrieved talking about a system with a, an API. It could be a native protocol like SQL. It could be flat text files. It could be just about anything. So challenge, we have so many sources we have to analyze. It might be Meraki data from, uh, uh, if we're lucky, you know, we, we're dealing with Meraki because their APIs are absolutely wonderful. Uh, with telephony, we have a variety of um, Cisco collaboration, you know, call manager APIs, Unity, uh, a whole host of others. Directory services are usually dealing with Microsoft, Act Microsoft Active Directory. IPAM, you might be dealing with BlueCAD or Infoblox, similar products. So th this is, we're, let's take a look at not just the protocols that are going to be used to, these, to access these things, but you also have to take into account how you get the data, the, um, the API spec. So for instance, Meraki, we're using REST. It's again nice and easy. It's wonderful to use. Uses the Open API specification. For Call Manager, it's it's a little bit older, and so we're we're using SOAP here. Uh, we get the documentation in PDF for HTML, and so on and so forth. And some some of these things even have, in the case of uh, Call Manager JTOPY, you have language specific requirements. You have to use Java. So getting access to a bunch of different things in the back end from a single script can be, can be challenging at times. So as an example, let's take a look at an Ansible, uh, an Ansible playbook. For some reason, let's uh, assume that this Ansible playbook needs to talk to three different things, Blue Cat, Call Manager, and NetScalers. I'll make it up. Well, no, uh, kind of a crazy example, but we'll go with that. Now, for each instance, for each service in the back end, there's a series of steps you have to go through. You have to study the integration interfaces. You have to know, is it an API? Is it a native protocol? Is it, uh, how are we talking to this thing? We need to implement interface libraries for a specific language. You have to discover all the instances. We might have dev instances, prod instances. Uh, there, there could be a number of different instances of a given product in our environment. Number four, we acquire the roles and credentials go to each instance owner and say, I need some access, great. Now, number five, my personal favorite, 
addressing routing and firewall issues. Okay. Now let's say you go through all the trouble to do that for your script. And great, you've integrated directly with all the things. You're all done, right? No, no, no. As my teenagers say, but wait, there's more. Eight months later, your phone rings at 2 a.m. and you have entered the API circle of suffering. Now, things that lead to API call failure, seemingly, you know, seemingly the worst times. Um, credential expiration, that's a classic. Source changes, the uh, source might be upgraded to a newer version. Maybe you upgraded your call manager. Maybe um, you know, the, somebody did a somebody did a change and did a minor version upgrade and failed to mention it to anybody, and it changed the way the API behaves. Instance changes, we put a new, uh, maybe we replaced an old instance with a new one, and we forgot to include that in our integration scripts for pulling inventories, what have you. And finally, my personal favorite on this one is client changes. Has your Java version ever changed? Maybe you upgraded it to, to as a requirement for a new process and it broke one of your old scripts. It happens. So we can't always avoid these problems, but we can try our best to, uh, to mitigate them. So the, the approach I've taken is to create what amounts to a service mesh for the infrastructure. Now, this started off as a POC and ended up uh, evolving because the, the approach seemed to work. So the, the, what I've created today is called DRP, Declarative Resource Protocol. It's a JSON-based WebSocket subprotocol. And in a nutshell, it gives, it gives you a way to make your services declare themselves to a mesh. And processes that need to consume the data can simply go to a broker and the broker will make the request on behalf of the, the consumers. Now, going back to you know, the network is the heart of what we do, uh, ideally the registry and the brokers that we'll be seeing in a moment, they're meant to run as part of the network. Like imagine advertising your services uh, as you would a route through BGP, that sort of thing. And it, it allows, you know, the, the primary goal here is we wanna allow developers to spend their time on analysis and, uh, and what they need to do as opposed to unnecessary repetitive functions. Now again, uh, in DRP, sources are declared, not discovered. We don't wanna play Marco Polo with our systems. We don't want to have to chase everything down and go around all the time saying, who's there, are you there? You know, Has anything changed? It's like my kids with their report cards. I expect them to come home when report cards come out and bring them to me. I don't wanna to have to chase them down. So DRP, same thing. I want my systems to declare themselves. Tell me, what, do you, what would you say you do here? So, um, so DRP, it provides a logical, single logical endpoint that you can consume all those backend sources. Um, optionally, it also allows you to, it, you can do RPC, but also pub and sub operations. And the, uh, one of the key ideas of this is to promote a uh, integrate, promote an integrate once use many approach. A DRP mesh is made up of three basic types of nodes. We have the registries, registry nodes, provider nodes, and broker nodes. On the left-hand side, we see the native services and the instance where we would wanna to talk to Blue Cat call manager and NetScalers. We would have providers that interact with those native services. The providers take the capabilities of those services and advertise them to the registry, which in turn relays those to the broker. The consumers, when they need to access the information from the, uh, from the backend services, would make calls to the broker which would reach out to the providers and then in turn to the back end uh, to the native services. To understand what a provider is made of, we'll take a look at how we create one. And when we create a provider, we need to give it a series of global methods. Optionally, we can tell it what streams will be emitted from the provider. And most importantly, the object classes that will be, uh, that will be referenced from the provider. So for instance, in the case of call manager, we would have a list of CUCM users, CUCM devices, that sort of thing. 
So let's take a look at the difference between accessing a source traditionally through the mesh versus uh, through the mesh. In this case, our Ansible playbook is reaching out to BlueCat, Net CUCM, and uh, NetScaler directly. But through the mesh, it would go through the broker, as would our PowerShell scripts or even our web clients. And instead of going through each of those steps that we looked at before, you know, each of those five steps to get to all the backend systems directly, we now only have to do one. We only have to acquire the roles. So as long as the the process which requires the data can get to the broker, as long as it's using an account with the correct roles, it can get to everything it needs to on the back end. So time for a quick demo. We're going to take a look at the code that makes up a provider. In this case, it's going to be based on Node.js. We create a, a WebEx service. We're going to create a WebEx service class to, uh, to, to tie into WebEx and run a test function. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to execute a single function called list rooms. Done is I've taken the um, uh, the wonderful examples on, available on DevNet, and I'm using the Cisco's uh, Cisco provided module. I created a pass through function called list rooms. It turns around and it calls the WebEx rooms list. Also above. Aside from declaring those functions, we also have an open API doc. What this is going to do is it's going to inject the open API spec as well as all those capabilities into the mesh. So when we look at the RSage web interface, we see we can go to the topology and see all the elements, all the nodes currently in, in the uh, DRP mesh. We can look at the list of services by going to the base URL slash API doc and seeing the list of uh, API specs available. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the WebEx API and we're, we see where we earlier we created the list rooms function. We're going to execute that and execute. And we see all the JSON results that we would uh, that we would normally expect to see when making a call to WebEx API. Now there's another way that we can do this as well. One of the ideas of behind DRP is that one of the ability to navigate our services as we, as we would a directory structure. So what we can do is we can do an LS on, and uh, we, can, we can view the, uh, view the mesh, view the list of mesh services. And we see WebEx in there. Now the list rooms is execute is advertised as a client command. So we can do an LS on client commands, list those out. And we're let's go ahead and do the get open API. I'm sorry, the list rooms are gonna execute that same function. And we get the exact same JSON back that we got through the through the rest interface. Now imagine being able to do this not just for WebEx and for, uh, uh, for, for the wonderful API functions available through it, but being able to, to, to navigate your, uh, your services, your, your call manager, uh, being able to um, look at your listing, listing of, of devices through a single logical mechanism like this. So the, the benefit here is you have a single, common interface that you can use to traverse, to enumerate, and to, and to dig down into your, uh, your infrastructure sources. And this is, this is really where it is now, but for future state, one of, the, uh, one of the moonshot goals is to be able to take your infrastructure sources and execute graph queries on them, to be able to take those different, uh, those, all those disparate backend services and to run distributed graph queries in, in a way that is very intuitive, and um, and and I think one day one day we will we will definitely get there. So let's take a look at um, at again the future state. What what would be to me would be amazing one day would be to see it to where we don't have to have providers 
interacting with native services, but the native services would inject themselves into the mesh and they would act as their own providers. So that would be, um, I think that would be, in five years from now, I really hope to be speaking on that, how it's been done and, and how everybody can use graph queries now to, um, uh, to cross-reference their infrastructure sources. So right now, again, this is, um, it started off as a POC, it turned into a little something more. Um, is it for you? You know, it's, it's a neat little approach. I like it. It simplifies source accesses, uh, simplifies source uh, access. It promotes integrate once use many approach. Um, potentially consolidates access to all aspects of an object where attributes are uh, distributed across the system. So, you know, a PC, you might, or a, a server, you might have attributes for a server spread across a few different systems. This might give us a way to aggregate access to those attributes. Um, and now downsides to using this approach, you lose resolution in your logs because you're using API users or you're using API credentials to interact full backend services. Uh, you eliminate the shortest route between the consumer and the source and a uh, relatively small development team, just one right now. So. Uh, the project in, used in this demo is available on my uh, GitHub site, uh, github.com slash ADHD tech uh, slash DRP. And that is, um, that is it. Thank you very much for your time and look forward to seeing you all out there.